Good morning. He is risen. Our scripture reading this morning are taken from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. This can be found on page 33 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible. The second reading is taken from Philippians chapters, chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. This can be found on page 198 in the New Testament. Reading from Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 1. Hear what the church says. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and, he, and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. In him not having a right... Yeah, I just... For he has been raised... He has said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, and, run and ran to tell his disciples, Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And then reading from Philippians chapters 3, verse 4. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more circ circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of, he a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless yet whatever gains I had. These I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found. In him not having a righteous of my own that came from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith I want to know. Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. This is the word of the Lord. The American humorist, um, whose name is escaping me at the, at the moment, wrote once that life is actually a lot like football. You have to block your fears and score points when you get the chance. I learned a lot about football growing up. I learned a lot about life playing football growing up. But I've always loved, and the story, the story of Tommy Thompson and the Philadelphia Eagles has always risen to the top for me. It was uh, early fall, 1945, and the Eagles were playing host to the New York Jets. Tommy Thompson had just returned to the NFL, and the coach was a little worried about him. He wasn't worried about him because 
Tommy had one eye. That was the NFL in 1945. If you had one eye, that's why you got to play quarterback. <laughs> he was worried about him because Tommy had just returned from three years of service overseas in the Second World War and had returned with his reflexes a little slowed. The coach was worried that Tommy was going to take one too many hits and, and his arm might suffer. So the coach, thinking quickly, his name was uh, a Hall of Fame coach named uh, Earl Greasy Neal, decided to modify the, the, the Eagles' double B wing formation and combine it with their short, fu- short punt uh, offense. That may mean nothing to you, but you may know it by another name because in that moment, the shotgun offense was born. That what happened next is the stuff of legend. Rumor has it that, uh, that, a, that an indefinite timeout was called and the referees were so puzzled by this strange new event that they had to call the then fledgling NFL's commissioner in to weigh in on this new uh, scenario. Who, and all of the referees and all of the experts studied the rule book in depth and found that there was in fact no rule saying that snap had to be taken from under center. The game was changed. But not just the game that Tommy Thompson happened to be playing in. Today, every team from Pee Wee up to the pros runs a shotgun offense from time to time. One change, one decision, one new experience changed not only that game, but the nature of the game itself. We live in a world where conventional wisdom says people do not rise from the dead. We live in a world where conventional wisdom says this life is all you get. And if that's true, then you have not only an obligation, but it is um, in fact a moral obligation to make sure that you look out for you. You have a biological imperative built into you that says that you and your family must be taken care of at all costs. Because that is as close to eternity, your genes are as close to eternity as you get. If this life is all there is, then feel free, in fact, be encouraged to lie and cheat and steal if that means that you can have more resources for you and yours. If this life is all that you get according to conventional wisdom, then you have an obligation to play the game by a certain set of rules. The Yale theologian, though, Yaroslav Pelikan, put it this way. If Christ is risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. To call the resurrection the linchpin of Christianity is not an understatement. On it, literally everything else hangs. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, said this, If Christ, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised from the dead. And if Christ is not raised from the dead, then he, then you and your faith in him is in vain, and you are still in your sins. Everything, everything hangs on whether or not the tomb was, in fact, empty. If Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. But to get to that conclusion... is a bumpy road. To get to that conclusion means to be affected by a historical event. And seldom, if ever, are people affected by history. Even historians aren't really affected by history. They may, historical events may affect people, but rarely, if ever, will they have an effect on them. But that's why Paul said, For all the conventional wisdom that I hold, all of the success I've had in my life up to this point, all of the birth 
privileges that I've experienced, all of it combined means nothing to me if the rules of the game have fundamentally changed and there is this new power in, at play in the world around me. And Paul said the, those famous words, I long to know the power of Christ and his resurrection. The resurrection is a power at play in the world around us. And to get there requires a whole person. Because resurrection doesn't just change lives. It changes life itself. To get there requires as much change as football experience when Tommy Thompson decided to take that first snap from five yards back. And getting there requires you to commit to this truth, not just with your head as a historical event, but also with your heart and with your hands. It's a truth that contains at once information, implication, and application. Let's, I want to take a step back, and I want to look at the resurrection this morning from about 30,000 feet. It's a story that we've read so many times that we take it for granted that this is a, a statement of our faith, that this is something that we believe, that we believe without seeing. I want to challenge your, that assumption this morning because I don't think that saying Christ is risen is a faith statement. I think it takes a lot more faith to believe that Christ didn't rise from the grave and that the church continued to be what the church became. I think that there is more faith required to say that Christ did not raise than that he did. I want to, let's look at this for a second, just from 30,000 feet. Number one, the gospel was first preached in the city where the crucifixion happened three days earlier. In general, if you're going to make something up, don't make it so easy to disprove. If you want to tell a story about a guy who was crucified and then rose from the grave, don't tell that the second part of the story where the first part happened. The only possible explanation that would not have immediately discredited all of the early witnesses, all of the early Christians, was if the tomb was not in fact, was in fact empty. Second time I've done that. <laughs> Secondly, we have hostile witnesses. We have a first century Jewish account called the Toledot Yezu, uh, which, is a, which is a first century Jewish document that, out, that admits they knew that, that everyone in Jerusalem knew the tomb was empty. There's no reason for hostile witnesses to admit something that they did not themselves believe to be true. We'll, talk, we'll come back to that in a second. Thirdly, we have archaeological, verified archaeological evidence that the, that the earliest gospel accounts of the resurrection were written, which written down between four and seven years of the crucifixion. That's too soon for any legendary involvement to have happened. Fourthly, fourthly, there is no archaeological evidence that the early tomb of Jesus was venerated and first century practice it would have been common to, to celebrate and to mark the site of holy men. It happened to rabbis all the time in first century Palestine, but there is no archaeological evidence that it happened with Jesus. And in fact, the tomb, the, the church today that, sit, that sits atop the church of the Holy Sepulchre in, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem is at best a guess of, from, from Constantine onward. Fifthly, in all four Gospels, the writers agree that the first people to experience the resurrection were not men but women. And in the first century, women were not allowed to testify in court. A woman's testimony did not count. And so the only reason that you would Im include women's testimony in this story is if it was, in fact, true. Now, add into this the possibility that maybe the disciples stole the body that maybe the, the guard posted at the tomb is in fact a fabrication. We have evidence that every single one of the earliest disciples, the people who may possibly have come up with this idea of stealing a body, were crucified or martyred in particularly vicious ways. And I don't know about you, but I'm not particularly willing to die for a lie I made up.
add into this even still the, the fact that the, the idea that a person would be resurrected, that an individual might be resurrected, was a wholly new concept in the first century world. Put all of this together, and on the basis of probability, you have all of this, evidence, this preponderance of evidence on one side, and on the other side, you have the, con- the conventional wisdom that says people do not rise from the dead unless they do. All of the evidence, the reality that we think we know. Our conventional wisdom says people do not rise from the dead, but what happens when they do? A couple months ago, Beth and I were watching uh, the movie, the reclamation movie, Rudolph, stop motion, I guess it is, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and the movie's always kind of bothered me. Um, I always thought it was because of the lackadaisical approach it takes to really awful bullying, but then it hit me. It hit me as I was watching the, the, the pivotal scene of the movie where Hermie, who is an elf who desperately more than anything wants to be a dentist, <laughs> uses his textbook dentistry skills to pluck the teeth from the abominable snowman. And then it hit me. It bothers me because this story is not actually about Christmas. This story is about Easter. See, because in that moment... The abominable snowman still roars, but they're not afraid of him anymore. In that moment, the abominable snowman still rears rears his rears back and and with his vicious claws, but Hermie and the and the crowd simply walk past him. The implication of Easter for us today asks us that simple, tangible, beautiful question: what happens when people do rise from the dead? When they do, Christians in the third century run into plague-infested Alexandria and spend their, and risk their lives and their health taking care of the sick and develop a reputation for being the people that you go to when something happens. When they do, Christians refuse to recount, recant the name of Jesus even when threatened with pain and death because they understood that there was nothing that the worst and the most powerful and the strongest kings of history could threaten them with. They carried this gospel to every single corner of the planet because they believe that the cure for cancer is worth sharing and so much, so, so much more so is the cure for death itself. The conventional wisdom of our world says people do not rise from the dead, but what happens when they do? The church is born. But all, all that proves to this point is that the power of resurrection that Paul desperately sought to know in his own life was a personal, an an, an impersonal, impractical stranger. That it was something that happened. If Jesus had simply disappeared from the grave on that Easter morning, then the, the power of the resurrection might still have remained unknown. But it didn't. Jesus' resurrection was a resurrection into a bodily form so he could not just demonstrate that resurrection has a real physical power in our world as as tangible as gravity and as sure as entropy, but to demonstrate that this resurrection power is at once personal, relational, missional, and incarnational. He demonstrated that it was personal when he rose from the grave and the first thing he did was worry about the people who had spent their lives getting to know him. He demonstrated that the resurrection power was relational when he, when he made a point of, finding, of seeking out the one disciple who was missing, who had abandoned him, and res- not just restoring him to the community, but asking him to take care of that community. He demonstrated it was missional when he, said, when he, when he, when he decided to leave and say, now go and spread this good news to every single one of the people that you meet. Go into every corner of the planet and bring this great gospel to them. And he proved it was incarnational when he left and said, okay, now you, frail, fragile, broken individuals, now it's up to you to carry on this legacy. Now it's up to you to rely on something bigger than yourselves. Now it's up to you to take this truth and make it more than just something we know in our heads, to make it something that we just, make it more than something that we just feel in our hearts and make it more than something we just experience one day a year. Easter 
the resurrection, that the power that Paul sought and the power that raised Jesus from the dead continues to work in the lives and in the heart of the church of God in every single city in the world. We experience it today and every Sunday. We experience it when we gather together for worship. We experience the power of the resurrection when we seek to be more emblematic of the one who has risen. Easter has the power to change not just my life and not just your life, but life itself. Thanks be to God that he is risen, for he is risen indeed. Amen. Let us continue to worship in